Are you ready to journey back in time and take a look at one of the darkest chapters of TAW global history that caused massive bloodshed and political turmoil? If yes, buckle up as we are going to take a closer look at the life story of Idi Amin, a man whose name reverberates through history with both infamy and fascination has to be Idi Amin. Idi Amin was a military dictator of Uganda. With his imposing demeanor and ruthless actions, he remains a subject of immense fascination and intrigue even today. But who was Idi Amin? How did he rise to power? What drove him to commit such unspeakable actions of violence? And how did he manage to retain an iron grip on power for so long? In today's video, we are going to explore the life and legacy of Idi Amin and spill the beans on his meteoric rise to power to the series of atrocities committed by him. So without any delay, let's get straight into it. Idi Amin was born in the heart of Africa under uncertain circumstances. There are several contradictions about his birth and early life. Historians are not sure when and where Idi Amin was born. Most sources assert that he was born in Kampala, or Koboko, towards the northwest of Uganda, in 1925. Other unverified sources state his birth year anywhere from 1923 to 1928. Amin's son adds to the mystery around his birthplace and year by claiming his father was born in Kampala in 1928. Similar to the discrepancies around his birthplace and birth year, background details of Edie's father are also uncertain. However, researcher Fred Guedo discovered that Amin is the son of Andreas Niabire, a member of the Kakwa ethnic group who later changed his religion and converted to Islam in 1910. Andrea also changed his name to Amin Dada. He also named his son after himself. Amin's mother, Asa Ate also has a disputed background. Historians claim she was either an ethnic Lugbara or Kakwa. She was a renowned herbalist who served the members of Buganda royalty. The lack of definitive information about such a prominent figure adds to the intrigue of his story. Of whatever little we know of his childhood, Amin's childhood was far from conventional. His father abandoned him at an early age leaving him in the care of his mother who raised him all alone. Amin's upbringing, marked by the absence of his father and the influence of his mother, offers a glimpse into the formative experiences that shaped his character. Such an unconventional childhood might have influenced his later actions and decisions as a leader. Soon, Amin started his formal education at an Islamic school in Bombo in 1941 where he learnt about the tenets of Islam and some basic English language. Amin's formal education years coincided with the Second World War. The backdrop of Amin's early education during World War II adds an intriguing layer. Exploring these lesser-known aspects of Idi Amin's early life deepens our understanding of the complex factors that contributed to his rise to power and the enigmatic legacy he left behind. Insight into historical background To have a closer look at Amin's life, one must begin by a thorough background knowledge of Uganda's historical context during the British colonial influence. The Kingdom of Buganda was divided among religious factions, including adherents of the Native religion, Catholics, Protestants and Muslims, leading to power struggles and shifting alliances. In 1888, Mwanga Ai, the king of Buganda, was overthrown in a coup led by Muslims, but he was later reinstated with the support of a coalition of Protestants and Catholics, backed by the Imperial British East Africa Company, IBIAC. The British played a significant role in Uganda during this time. The period was marked by conflicts including a civil war in 1892 and concerns over potential warfare and the interests of other European powers prompted the British government to extend its support for the IBIC in Uganda. 
Ultimately, in 1893, the IBIC ended its involvement in Uganda and the British government took over administration. A treaty was signed in 1893, introducing a plan for double chieftainships, where each chieftainship had one Protestant and one Catholic chief. On June 18, 1894, Uganda was officially declared a protectorate under British control, bringing about significant changes in its political and economic landscape. From 1894 to 1901, the Uganda Agreement of 1900 consolidated the power of largely Protestant Bakungu client chiefs, with London sending few officials to administer the country, relying on the Bakungu chiefs' political skills and collaboration. By the 1920s, British administrators were more self-assured and colonial officials taxed cash crops produced by peasants. Uganda's transition to a protectorate while retaining some self-government significantly impacted its economic systems. British focus was primarily financial and the chiefs negotiated to maintain self-governance, royal lineage and private land tenure. The Baganda people were key administrators, extending their influence, language, and culture, which often led to resentment among other ethnic groups. Despite economic exploitation, political fragmentation, and social disruptions during colonialism, British rule in Uganda brought certain advancements in infrastructure and education. There were significant advancements in Uganda's infrastructure, the colonial administration invested in transportation networks, including railways, roads and ports, improving connectivity within the country and facilitating trade. They also established schools, hospitals and administrative structures, which laid the foundation for future development. The introduction of Western education and Christianity brought changes to traditional social structures and religious practices. While some Ugandans benefited from access to education and exposure to new ideas, others experienced cultural assimilation and the erosion of their indigenous heritage. Under British rule, Uganda also experienced economic development, particularly in the agriculture sector. Cash crops like cotton and coffee were introduced. Another key development that occurred during this time was the establishment of the Ugandan military. The British government began formal military training of the native Ugandans in the early 20th century. In the late 19th century, the British established a military force in Uganda known as the Uganda Rifles. The Uganda Rifles consisted of a mix of British and Sudanese troops and was under the command of British officers. This force was initially formed as an internal security force responsible for maintaining peace within tribal areas and safeguarding British interests. On January 1, 1902, the Uganda Rifles underwent a reformation and was renamed the King's African Rifles KAR. This reformation aimed to create a more organized and structured military force in Uganda. The KAR was tasked with various roles including internal security and defense. During World War I, the Ugandan contingent of the car played a significant role in the East African campaign against German forces. Their contributions were recognized as they became a more cohesive and capable fighting force. In such circumstances, British colonialism was at its peak and Second World War II was raging. Idi was growing up and acquiring his formal education. However, in 1941, E.D. dropped out after completing his fourth grade English language in education and did odd jobs. Foray into the military world. From humble beginnings, Idi Amin finally made a foray into the military world. In 1946, when Idi Amin was about 21 or 22, he joined the British King's African Rifles, KRR, to serve as an assistant cook. The KRR was a British colonial military force that recruited soldiers from various African countries, including Uganda. Amin's choice to join the military was not uncommon among young men seeking employment and opportunities at the time. Simultaneously, 
he underwent military training until 1947. His early years in the military saw him serving as a cook and a wrestler, showcasing his physical prowess and earning him a reputation for his strength and athleticism. Amin's larger-than-life personality and natural leadership qualities soon caught the attention of his superiors. Idi Amin's military career began to take shape, ultimately propelling him towards a path of power and influence. Amin's journey in the military was marked by ambition, charisma, and a rise through the ranks, ultimately leading to his appointment as a key figure within the colonial army. While later, falsely claiming that he served in the Burma campaign of World War II, he was transferred to Kenya for infantry duty in 1947, serving in the 21st KR Infantry Battalion in Gilgil, Kenya colony, until 1949. In 1949, his unit was deployed to northern Kenya to combat Somali rebels. In 1952, Amin's brigade was sent to suppress the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya, showcasing his early exposure to conflict and combat. He progressed through the ranks, achieving the rank of corporal in 1952 and sergeant in 1953. By 1959, he had reached the highest rank possible for a black African at that time, becoming an Effendi Class II warrant officer. In 1959, Amin returned to Uganda, where he received a short service commission as a lieutenant on July 15, 1961, becoming one of the first two Ugandans to attain commissioned officer status. His assignment included resolving issues related to cattle rustling between Uganda's Karamojong and Kenya's Turkana nomads. Amin's military career exposed him to various conflicts and provided him with combat experience, which would later play a role in his rise to power in Uganda. His leadership style was influenced by his military experiences, characterized by direct and hands-on approaches, which contributed to his popularity among certain segments of Ugandan society. It was during this period in the military that Amin honed his skills in leadership, command, and manipulation skills that would prove instrumental in his later rise to power. His experiences within the British colonial army allowed him to navigate the intricacies of military hierarchies and gain valuable insights into the art of command. Ultimately, Amin's military career during the British colonial rule in Uganda acted as a springboard for his later political ambitions. Rise in the military world it almost took 72 years for Uganda to free itself from the chains of British colonialism. In the 1900s, the British had signed an agreement giving Buganda autonomy. However, it later turned into a constitutional monarchy, which was regulated by the Protestants' chiefs. The British had also promised to establish a legislative council in 1921, but there was no African representation until 1945. As a consequence, during the World War II period, Ugandan people rebelled against the British government and demanded for more representation and less British control. Finally, in 1958, the British relented and allowed the Ugandan natives to form a self-government. During the Lancestor Conference, which occurred in 1960, the British authorities allowed Uganda to hold its own elections, which ultimately led to their independence. On October 9, 1962, Uganda officially gained independence from British colonial rule. The country transitioned into a constitutional monarchy with Sir Edward Mutesa II as its first president. However, political tensions and power struggles soon emerged leading to a series of political changes and instability in the following years. Amin's strategic positioning within the military hierarchy allowed him to take advantage of political events and power struggles within Uganda during the independence years. In the 1960s, as Uganda approached independence from British colonial rule, Amin strategically aligned himself with political factions that were gaining influence and sought to secure their support. By positioning himself as a loyal and dedicated military officer, Amin garnered the trust of influential figures within the government and military. 
His rise to the rank of major and subsequent appointments to key positions reflected both his military capabilities and his ability to navigate the shifting political landscape. After Uganda gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1962, Idi Amin's military career continued its ascent. He swiftly rose through the ranks, being promoted to captain in 1962 and further to major in 1963. By 1964, Amin was appointed deputy commander of the army, and a year later, he assumed the position of commander of the army. His ascent culminated in 1970, when he was promoted to commander of all the armed forces. In addition to his military prowess, Amin had a notable athletic background. Standing at an imposing 1.93 meters, six feet four inches, and possessing a robust physique, he was the Ugandan light heavyweight boxing champion from 1951 to 1960, excelling in swimming and rugby as well. Although he had a reputation as a formidable rugby forward, some colleagues noted his limited intellectual acumen. Amin's athletic achievements and urban myths surrounding his selection for the East Africa Rugby Union team bolstered his public image. However, Amin's military career was marred by allegations of involvement in illicit activities. In 1965, he and Prime Minister Milton Obote were implicated in a scheme to smuggle ivory and gold into Uganda from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This operation, linked to aiding anti-Congolese government forces, aimed to exchange ivory and gold for secretly smuggled arms supplies. In response, the Ugandan parliament called for an investigation. In 1966, Obote responded by imposing a new constitution that eliminated the ceremonial presidency held by Kabaka, King Mutesa II of Buganda, declaring himself executive president. In a swift escalation, Amin was promoted to colonel and army commander. He orchestrated an attack on the Kabaka's palace, compelling Mutesa into exile in the United Kingdom, where he remained until his death in 1969. During this time, Amin began recruiting soldiers from various ethnic groups, including the Kakwa, Lugbara, and South Sudanese, particularly from the West Nile region bordering South Sudan. The South Sudanese had a historical presence in Uganda, having migrated from South Sudan to serve in the colonial army in the early 20th century. It's alleged that a significant portion of Amin's military force comprised South Sudanese soldiers. This diverse composition had far-reaching consequences for Uganda's political and ethnic landscape. Seizure of power. Soon after the independence of Uganda and promotion of Idi Amin to higher ranks, there was a struggle of power and political indifference between Idi Amin and Milton, where two mighty rivers meet, the land quakes and chaos unfurls. This ancient saying warns of the tumultuous consequences when two powerful leaders converge. In historical lore, you must have heard stories of clashes between two strong leaders can lead to upheavals and unanticipated outcomes, leaving behind a wake of turmoil that echoes through the ages. Yes, there was a tug of war for control, power, and conflicting interests which came into play and strained the relationship of Idi Amin and Milton, which was a highlight in Ugandan history. Tensions between Idi Amin and Milton Obote had been simmering for some time, fueled by various factors. Amin had been busily recruiting soldiers from the West Nile region, establishing a power base within the Uganda army. He also became involved in operations supporting the rebellion in southern Sudan. In February 1966, amid allegations of involvement in illicit gold and ivory trade, Ugandan leader Obote suspended the constitution and declared himself executive president. Not long after, he dispatched Amin to depose King Mutiza II, known as King Freddy, who ruled the influential Buganda kingdom. Adding to this volatile mix was an attempted assassination on Obote's life in 1969. Over the next few years, amidst political intrigue, 
two unsuccessful assassination attempts targeting the duo remained shrouded in mystery. As time passed, doubts about Amin's loyalty arose, prompting Obodi to order Amin's arrest en route to a Commonwealth Heads of Government conference in Singapore. These mounting issues exacerbated their already strained relationship. This marked a turning point in their relationship and set the stage for future political turmoil in Uganda. Not only this, Oboti's government in Uganda was already facing a lot of hatred from the general public due to its concentration of power, economic challenges, and cultural tensions. One of the major factors was the suspension of the constitution and his assumption of executive powers in 1966. This move led to a concentration of authority in his hands and eroded democratic processes, causing resentment among the public. Obote's government was also criticized for its economic policies, which were perceived as mismanagement and corruption-ridden. The economy struggled and there were concerns about wealth distribution and social inequality. His government's actions against traditional institutions, such as sending Idi Amin to depose King Mutesa Seku of Buganda, sparked cultural and ethnic tensions. Oboti's policies were seen as undermining the autonomy of traditional leaders and the cultural identity of certain regions. The breaking point came in October 1970 when Obote assumed direct control of the armed forces. Amin, who had been appointed commander of all the armed forces just months earlier, saw his influence wane as he was relegated to the position of commander of the Uganda army. Seizing the opportunity to safeguard his position, Amin orchestrated a military coup on January 25, 1971, while Obote was away attending a Commonwealth summit in Singapore. His loyal troops swiftly took control of strategic locations, including Entebbe International Airport and the capital city, Kampala. Obote's residence was surrounded, major roads were blocked, and a radio broadcast accused Obote's government of corruption and favoritism toward the Lango region. This sudden turn of events was met with jubilation by cheering crowds in the streets of Kampala. Amin, a military man rather than a politician, asserted that his regime would serve as a temporary caretaker government until the situation stabilized. He pledged to release all political prisoners, seeking to present himself as a unifying figure during this turbulent period. In April 1971, Amin further showcased his authority by organizing a state funeral for Edward Mutesa, the former king, Kabaka, of Buganda and exiled president. This move underscored Amin's growing control and influence in Uganda's political landscape, road to dictatorship. In January 1971, Uganda was at yet another turning point. No one knew this was just the beginning of Uganda's darkest chapters of all times. For those who thought the British colonial rule was worse didn't know, the worst was yet to come. The nation's fate hung in the balance as Idi Amin, a towering military figure, orchestrated a coup that would change the course of its history. His bold move was met with widespread approval, as many hoped it would bring much-needed unity to a country torn by internal strife. Western nations, including Britain, shared this sentiment, relieved that Milton Obote's regime had come to an end. Obote's policies had raised suspicions of a leftward shift and the spread of communism, causing concern among these nations. Amin pledged to guide Uganda back to civilian government within five years, offering a glimmer of hope to a nation weary of turmoil. However, cracks in his leadership soon began to appear. Unlike his Western-educated predecessor, Amin lacked formal education in the Western style. Therefore, Amin had little choice than to employ violence to maintain peace and order. Just one week after seizing power, on February 2, 1971, Idi Amin assumed a host of titles, declaring himself President of Uganda, 
Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Uganda Army Chief of Staff, and Chief of Air Staff. With swift strokes, he suspended key provisions of the Ugandan constitution, setting the stage for a dramatic shift in the nation's governance. Amin wasted no time instituting his rule. He formed an advisory defense council composed of military officers, with himself at the helm as chairman. In a bold move, military tribunals were placed above the civil legal system. Soldiers began to fill top government positions and took charge of government-owned corporations. Amin even reminded civilian cabinet ministers that they were now subject to military courtesy. Under his decree-based governance, approximately 30 decrees were issued throughout his rule. The presidential lodge in Kampala underwent a name change, becoming the command post, symbolizing Amin's firm grip on power. He disbanded the General Service Unit, GSU, a former intelligence agency, and established the State Research Bureau, SRB, in its place. The SRB headquarters in the Kampala suburb of Nakasero soon became infamous as a site of torture and capital punishment. Amin employed various agencies to suppress dissent, including the military police and the Public Safety Unit, PSU. In the wake of these changes, Milton Obote, the ousted president, sought refuge in Tanzania, finding sanctuary under the protective wing of Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere. With him, 20,000 Ugandan refugees fled the Amin regime. In 1972, these exiles embarked on a poorly organized coup attempt, striving to regain control of Uganda, but their efforts ultimately proved unsuccessful. Attempts to persecute ethnic and political parties. Idi Amin's regime in Uganda underlined a troubling chapter in the nation's history, which was marked by attempts to persecute specific ethnic groups and suppress political opposition. During his rule from 1971 to 1979, Amin introduced a series of policies that targeted specific ethnic groups and sought to suppress political opposition. One keeps questioning what kind of impact did this mass expulsion have on the social fabric of Uganda, and how did it affect the country's economic landscape? Amin's regime specifically targeted ethnic groups, most notably the Acholi and Lango, whom he perceived as potential threats to his authority. He initiated brutal campaigns against these groups, resulting in widespread human rights abuses. Thousands of individuals from these communities were subjected to torture, extrajudicial killings, and displacement. The ethnic persecutions under Amin's rule contributed to a climate of fear and division within Ugandan society. Idi Amin's response to the 1972 attempted invasion by Ugandan exiles was swift and brutal. He launched a purge within the Uganda army, targeting those believed to be supporters of the ousted president Milton Obote. The majority of those in the crosshairs were from the Acholi and Lango ethnic groups. The violence erupted earlier, in July 1971, when Lango and Acholi soldiers were massacred in barracks located in Jinja and Mbarara. These events set the stage for more bloodshed. By early 1972, approximately 5,000 Acholi and Lango soldiers had vanished, and tragically, at least twice as many civilians suffered a similar fate. As the atrocities continued, victims began to include members of various ethnic groups, religious leaders, journalists, artists, senior bureaucrats, judges, lawyers, students, intellectuals, criminal suspects, and even foreign nationals. In this climate of brutality, many others were killed for criminal motives or simply at the whims of their assailants. Shockingly, some bodies were disposed of in the River Nile. These killings were driven by a toxic mix of ethnic, political, and financial motivations and persisted throughout Amin's eight-year reign. While the exact number of victims remains unknown, estimates vary significantly. The International Commission of Jurists placed the death toll at no fewer than 80,000, 
with more realistic figures hovering around 300,000. Meanwhile, exile organizations, with assistance from Amnesty International, suggested an even grimmer estimate of 500,000 lives lost to this dark chapter in Uganda's history. According to Henry Kayemba, who served as a Ugandan minister in Idi Amin's cabinet for three years, Amin's erratic behavior can be traced in part to his tribal heritage. Amin hailed from the Kakwa tribe, a group known for its warrior traditions, which included unsettling rituals involving slain enemies. These ancient practices, as Kiemba describes, included cutting flesh from the body of the deceased to subdue their spirit or even tasting the victim's blood to render their spirit powerless. Astonishingly, Kiemba suggests that these rituals still exist among the Kakwa. Kiemba goes on to reveal that Amin's peculiar behaviors extended beyond these rituals. On multiple occasions, Amin reportedly boasted to Kiemba and others that he had also consumed human flesh. In this environment of violence and fear, numerous prominent figures met their tragic end. Among those killed were Benedicto Kiwanuka, a former prime minister and chief justice, Janani Luwum, the Anglican Archbishop, Joseph Mubiru, the former governor of Uganda's central bank, Frank Kalimuzo, the vice-chancellor of Makarera University, Byron Kawadwa, a renowned playwright, and shockingly, even two of Amin's own cabinet ministers, Erinayo Wilson Oriema and Charles Oboth Ofumbi. These were dark times indeed for Uganda. Idi Amin's reign was marked by significant demographic imbalances in positions of power within Uganda. He strategically recruited followers from his own ethnic group, the Kakwas, and South Sudanese nationals. By 1977, these three groups accounted for a substantial majority in the upper echelons of the Ugandan government, making up 60% of the top 22 generals and a staggering 75% of the cabinet. Notably, despite being a minority in the population, Muslims occupied 80%, and 87.5% of these influential roles. This lopsided distribution of power helps elucidate why Amin managed to survive an astonishing eight attempted coups during his rule. The Uganda army underwent considerable expansion during Amin's tenure, growing from 10,000 to 25,000 by 1978. Yet, it was predominantly a mercenary force with a diverse composition. Half of the soldiers were South Sudanese, 26% Congolese, and only 24% Ugandan, with a significant portion of them being Muslim and Kakwa. Amin, in his rhetoric, often spoke of empowering ordinary Ugandans and transferring economic control into their hands. However, these claims appeared to contrast starkly with the composition of his government and military. On the persecution of minorities, he spoke, We are determined to make the ordinary Ugandan master of his own destiny, and above all, to see that he enjoys the wealth of his country. Our deliberate policy is to transfer the economic control of Uganda into the hands of Ugandans for the first time in our country's history. In August 1972, Idi Amin declared an economic war. This war implemented a set of policies which allowed the confiscation of properties owned by Asians and Europeans in Uganda. Uganda's Asian population, numbering around 80 Sankwan, primarily hailed from the Indian subcontinent and had deep roots in the country with their ancestors having arrived in search of opportunities during the era when India was still under British rule. Many of these Asians were business owners, including those operating large-scale enterprises, which played a crucial role in the Ugandan economy. On the 4th of August, 1972, Amin issued a decree that ordered the expulsion of the approximately 50,000 Asians who held British passports. Subsequently, this order was extended to encompass all 60,000 Asians who were not Ugandan citizens. 
In response, around 30,000 Ugandan Asians immigrated to the UK, while others sought refuge in Commonwealth nations like Australia, South Africa, Canada, and Fiji. Some also resettled in countries such as India, Kenya, Pakistan, Sweden, Tanzania, and the United States. Alongside the expulsion of these populations, Amin seized control of businesses and properties owned by Asians and Europeans and redistributed them among his supporters. However, this move had dire consequences. With experienced owners and proprietors gone, many of these enterprises fell into mismanagement and disrepair, leading to the collapse of numerous industries. This proved disastrous for Uganda's already struggling economy. At the time, Asians contributed significantly to the country's tax revenue, accounting for a staggering 90%. With their forced departure, Amin's administration not only lost a substantial portion of government income, but also pushed the economy to the brink of collapse. Idi Amin's reign was marred by a series of brutal acts, including the murder of an estimated 500 Yemeni Hadrami Arab merchants. In 1975, a significant defection occurred when Emmanuel Blayo Wakweya, who served as Idi Amin's finance minister and was one of his longest-serving cabinet members, sought refuge in London. This high-profile defection was a watershed moment that encouraged Henry Kiemba, Amin's health minister and a former official from the first Obote regime, to defect as well, eventually resettling in the UK. In 1977, Kayemba penned and published A State of Blood, an insider expose that offered a chilling account of Amin's rule. As Amin's grip on power tightened, the Defence Council declared him president for life on June 25, 1976, consolidating his authority over Uganda. International relations. You must be wondering, how do leaders who make such brutal and impulsive decisions impact their nation's standing on the global stage? Idi Amin's international relations were characterized by a mix of diplomatic challenges, controversial actions, and strained relationships with many countries. His unpredictable and often erratic behavior, coupled with his human rights abuses and aggressive foreign policies, resulted in a significant deterioration of Uganda's standing in the international community during his rule. Initially, Idi Amin enjoyed support from Western powers like Israel, West Germany, and, notably, the United Kingdom. During the late 1960s, the leftward shift in Milton Obote's policies, including the implementation of the Common Man's Charter, and the nationalization of 80 British companies raised concerns in the West. There was growing apprehension that Obote's administration might challenge Western capitalist interests in Africa and align Uganda with the Soviet Union. Amin, who had previously served in the King's African Rifles and participated in Britain's suppression of the Mau Mau uprising prior to Uganda's independence, had a reputation among the British as being intensely loyal to Britain. Consequently, he became a natural choice as a successor to Obote. While some speculate that Amin's ascension to power was planned as early as 1966, serious plotting by the British and other Western powers commenced in 1969, particularly after Obote initiated his nationalization program. Amin's controversial decision to expel Uganda's Asian population, predominantly of Indian and Pakistani descent, in 1972, strained relations with several countries. The expulsion led to a significant loss of skilled professionals and business expertise, damaging Uganda's economy. In the aftermath of the expulsion of Ugandan Asians in 1972, the majority of whom had Indian heritage, India took the diplomatic step of severing relations with Uganda. This move was a response to the discriminatory policies and human rights violations under Idi Amin's regime. During the same period, Amin initiated what he referred to as an economic war against various foreign entities. 
This included breaking diplomatic ties with the United Kingdom and nationalizing all British-owned businesses operating in Uganda. The United Kingdom and Israel, in response to these actions, suspended all trade relations with Uganda. However, the resulting commercial void created by these diplomatic rifts was swiftly filled by other countries. Countries including Libya, the United States, and particularly Soviet Union stepped in to engage in trade with Uganda, underscoring the complex geopolitical dynamics of the time and the shifting allegiances on the global stage during Idi Amin's rule. During the era of Leonid Brezhnev's leadership in the Soviet Union, the country developed a growing interest in Uganda as part of its broader geopolitical strategy. This interest was motivated by a desire to establish a strategic counterbalance to what the Soviets perceived as Chinese influence in neighboring Tanzania and Western influence in Kenya. In November 1973, the Soviet Union took significant steps to foster a relationship with Uganda. While it couldn't match the financial support provided by Western powers, the Soviet Union opted to offer military assistance to Idi Amin's regime in exchange for his political alignment and support. As a result, the Soviet Union emerged as Amin's primary source of military hardware. Uganda received a substantial array of military equipment from the Soviets, including tanks, aircraft, artillery, missiles, and small arms. The Soviet Union's support extended beyond weaponry, it also provided economic assistance, estimated at $12 million to the Ugandan government by 1975. Moreover, the Soviets facilitated the training of thousands of Ugandans in Eastern Bloc countries, particularly Czechoslovakia, in areas such as military tactics, intelligence operations, and technical skills. East Germany played a role in training personnel from agencies like the General Service Unit and the State Research Bureau, both notorious for their activities during Amin's rule. During the Ugandan invasion of Tanzania in 1979, East Germany sought to remove evidence of its involvement with these agencies. This intricate relationship between the Soviet Union and Uganda during Idi Amin's regime reflects the complex web of international alliances and power dynamics during that era. Similarly, Amin's relationship with Israel was initially friendly as Israel provided military assistance to Uganda. However, in 1976, Amin allowed Palestinian and German terrorists to hijack an Air France plane and land it in Entebbe, Uganda. In June 1976, a pivotal event unfolded when Idi Amin allowed an Air France airliner en route from Tel Aviv to Paris to be hijacked by members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, External Operations, PFLPEO, and German Revolutionäre Zellen. Initially, two hijackers from each group commandeered the plane, and they were later joined by three more individuals. In a complex turn of events, the hijackers released 156 non-Jewish hostages who did not hold Israeli passports, enabling them to return to safety. However, 83 Jews and Israeli citizens, along with 20 other individuals who refused to abandon them, including the captain and crew of the hijacked Air France jet, remained in captivity. In response to this tense situation, Israel executed a daring rescue mission known as Operation Thunderbolt, commonly referred to as Operation Entebbe. On the night of July the 3rd to 4th, 1976, Israeli commandos conducted a successful operation at Entebbe Airport. They took control of the airport and managed to liberate nearly all the hostages. Tragically, three hostages lost their lives during the operation and 10 others were wounded. Additionally, seven hijackers, approximately 45 Ugandan soldiers and one Israeli soldier, Yoni Netanyahu, the unit's commander, were killed. However, the aftermath of the operation took a grim turn. One of the hostages, a 75-year-old Jewish Englishwoman named Dora Bloch, had been taken to Mulago Hospital in Kampala before the rescue mission. 
Regrettably, she was subsequently murdered in reprisal. This hostage crisis severely strained Uganda's international relations, prompting the United Kingdom to close its High Commission in Uganda. Moreover, in retaliation for Kenya's support of the raid, Amin ordered the killing of hundreds of Kenyan residents in Uganda. This event cast a long shadow on Uganda's international standing and Amin's rule. The subsequent Israeli rescue operation, known as Operation Entebbe, strained relations between Amin and Israel, as well as with several Western countries. Amin's aggressive foreign policy and territorial ambitions led to tensions with neighboring Tanzania. In 1978, Amin ordered an invasion of Tanzania, which resulted in the Uganda-Tanzania War. Tanzania, with the support of Ugandan exiles, eventually overthrew Amin's regime in 1979. Amin's relations with Uganda's former colonial power, the United Kingdom, became increasingly strained over time. Amin expelled the British High Commissioner and severed diplomatic ties with the UK in 1976. The deteriorating relationship was further exacerbated by Amin's controversial actions and human rights abuses. During Idi Amin's rule in Uganda, a significant military buildup took place, raising concerns particularly in neighboring Kenya. In early June 1975, Kenyan authorities took action by impounding a substantial convoy of Soviet-made arms that was en route to Uganda, intercepting it at the port of Mombasa. Tensions between Uganda and Kenya escalated further in February 1976 when Amin made a provocative announcement. He declared his intention to investigate the historical claim that parts of southern Sudan and regions in western and central Kenya, extending within 32 kilometers, 20 miles, of Nairobi, were historically part of colonial Uganda. In response to Amin's assertion, the Kenyan government issued a stern statement affirming that Kenya would not relinquish a single inch of territory. This dispute reached a boiling point when Amin threatened to pursue the matter further. In reaction, the Kenyan army deployed troops and armored personnel carriers along the Kenya-Uganda border. Amin eventually backed down in the face of this strong response, averting a potential conflict over territorial claims. Additionally, Amin's relations with Rwanda were marked by tension. During his tenure, he repeatedly disrupted Rwanda's economy by denying transit to its commercial vehicles headed for the port of Mombasa. Furthermore, he made multiple threats to bomb the Rwandan capital, Kigali. These actions had significant implications for regional stability during Amin's rule. Amin's rule was marked by isolation from many countries due to his erratic behavior, human rights abuses, and controversial policies. Several Western nations imposed economic sanctions on Uganda, and Amin was widely condemned for his brutal regime and disregard for human rights. Policy towards women. Life under Idi Amin's regime in Uganda was indeed a very difficult and often contradictory mix of experiences, especially for women. Amin portrayed himself as an advocate of females' rights, yet his actions often contradicted his claims. While he appointed women to high-profile government positions for public relations purposes, he also exploited traditional gender roles and expectations to exert control over the population. In reality, masculinity was promoted and glorified and using the religion card. His regime also promoted traditional gender duties and modesty among women. Female rights were almost paralyzed. These rights were often suppressed and sacrificed to gain male loyalty. Women had little to zero legislative protection during Idi Amin's era. During British rule, many female expats had formed groups which promoted female rights and contributed positively to the community. However, many historians, including Eileen Murray Tripp, highlight that there is substantial record that suggests that there were frequent disappearances of women along with children. Groups 
of such women along with children would be kidnapped and never found again during his time. One notable example of Amin's policy towards women was his infamous decision to outlaw miniskirts in 1972. This move, framed as a moral issue, subjected women who wore miniskirts to public humiliation and assault. It served a dual purpose. It discouraged dissent against Amin's policies while also encouraging women to monitor and police each other's behavior. He also launched another extremely unpopular morality campaign that declared unmarried or Christian females as prostitutes. Army men were also encouraged to impregnate such women. It is hard to believe that Amin even banned deodorants, creams and perfumes for women. Such bizarre moves indicate that Amin maintained an extremely regressive policy towards women. In this way, Amin's regime used gender-based policies to maintain a grip on power and control over the population. The experiences of ordinary Ugandans, particularly women, during this period were shaped by the complex interplay between Amin's rhetoric and the harsh realities of his authoritarian rule. Personal life. One can't help but wonder what Idi Amin's personal life looked like. How did Idi Amin's relationships with women, including his multiple wives and mistresses, shape his personal life? Known for his complex personal life, Idi Amin was a polygamist who entered into at least six marriages, with three ending in divorce. His first two wives, Malyamu and Kay, were married in 1966. In 1967, he married Nora, followed by his union with Nalongo Medina in 1972. However, on March 26, 1974, Amin announced on Radio Uganda that he had divorced Malyamu, Nora, and Kay. Malyamu was subsequently arrested in Tororo on the Kenyan border in April 1974 on charges of attempting to smuggle fabric into Kenya. Tragically, in 1974, Kay Amin died under mysterious circumstances, with her body found dismembered. Nora fled to Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in 1979, and her current whereabouts remain unknown. In July 1975, Amin organized a lavish two million wedding to a 19-year-old girl called Sara Kiolaba, a go-go dancer with the Revolutionary Suicide Mechanized Regiment Band, known as Suicide Sara. The wedding coincided with the Organization of African Unity, OAU, summit meeting in Kampala, where Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, served as Amin's best man. Sarah and Amin had four children together and shared a passion for rally race driving. By 1993, Amin was living with his last nine children and one wife, Mama Achumaru, who was the mother of his youngest four children. His final known child, daughter Iman, was born in 1992. Records suggest that Amin fathered more than 60 children. Deposition and Exile The late 1970s marked the end of Idi Amin's terrifying military reign. In January 1977, Idi Amin appointed General Mustafa Adrisi as the Vice President of Uganda, a move aimed at consolidating his power. However, this decision exacerbated tensions within the Uganda army leading to a split between Amin's supporters and soldiers loyal to Adrisi. Adrisi, who held significant influence in the government, sought to purge foreigners, especially Sudanese, from the military. This growing dissatisfaction within the Uganda army was mirrored by a series of coup attempts, including one in which Amin was wounded, known as Operation Mafuta Mingi, in June 1977. As the year 1978 dawned, Amin's circle of supporters and close associates had dwindled significantly. Dissent among the Ugandan populace was mounting due to the collapse of the economy and infrastructure, a consequence of years of neglect and abuse. The situation worsened following the killings of Bishop Luwum and Ministers Oriema and Oboth Ofumbi in 1977. In response, several of Amin's ministers defected or fled into exile. 
During the early 1978, General Adrisi was severely injured in a car accident and sent to Cairo for treatment. During his absence, Amin removed him from his positions as Minister of Defense and Minister of Home Affairs. Amin also accused Adrisi of retiring senior prison officials without his consent. These actions resulted in Amin taking personal control of multiple ministerial portfolios. Amin's reshuffling of his government led to political unrest and further infuriated Adrisi's followers, who suspected that the car accident had been a failed assassination attempt. In November 1978, a significant turning point occurred. Troops loyal to General Adrisi mutinied against Amin's rule. Amin responded by deploying his own troops to suppress the mutiny, which had spilled across the Tanzanian border. This border conflict escalated into a full-scale invasion of Tanzanian territory by the Uganda army, although the reasons behind it remain a subject of debate among experts and politicians. Some argue that Amin directly ordered the invasion as a diversion from the crises at home. Others suggest that he had lost control of certain factions within the Uganda army, and his approval was more of a post facto attempt to save face. As the conflict intensified, Amin accused Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere of initiating the war against Uganda, even proclaiming the annexation of a section of Tanzanian territory. However, Facing the impending Tanzanian counteroffensive, Amin appeared to realize the gravity of his situation and sought a way to de-escalate the conflict without appearing weak. He sent quite an unconventional proposal to challenge Nyerere to a boxing match, suggesting that the outcome of this spectacle could replace military action. Yet. Nyerere chose to ignore Amin's unusual message. In January 1979, Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere took decisive action. He mobilized the Tanzania People's Defense Force and launched a counterattack into Ugandan territory. Joining Nyerere were various groups of Ugandan exiles who had formed the Uganda National Liberation Army, UNLA. Amin's army found itself retreating steadily in the face of this determined offensive, despite receiving military assistance from figures like Libya's Muammar Gaddafi and the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO. During this tumultuous period, Amin reportedly embarked on several foreign trips to countries like Saudi Arabia and Iraq, seeking additional support for his dwindling regime, which was just about to come to an end. While Amin made fewer public appearances in the final months of his rule, he surprisingly continued to address the nation through radio and television broadcasts. The final blow to his rule was the Battle of Lukaya that occurred between Ugandan rebels and Tanzanian forces in 1979. Following a significant defeat in the Battle of Lukaya, portions of the Uganda army's leadership implored Amin to step down. However, he defiantly refused even dismissing his chief of staff, Yusuf Gowon. Eventually, on April 11, 1979, with Kampala failing to advancing forces, Amin was compelled to flee the Ugandan capital via helicopter. Defiant to the end, Amin adamantly refused to step down, even declaring, if you don't want to fight, I'll do it myself. This decision led to the dismissal of his chief of staff, Yusuf Gowon. However, as the situation grew increasingly dire, Amin's time in power came to an abrupt end. On April 11, 1979, with the capture of Kampala imminent, he fled the Ugandan capital by helicopter. After a fleeting attempt to regroup some remnants of the Uganda army in eastern Uganda, during which Amin reportedly proclaimed the city of Jinja as his country's new capital, he continued his escape. Amin initially sought refuge in Libya, where he resided until 1980. Later, he found a more permanent home in Saudi Arabia, where the Saudi royal family provided sanctuary and a generous subsidy in exchange for his withdrawal from politics. During his exile, 
Amin lived for several years on the top two floors of the Novotel Hotel on Palestine Road in Jeddah. It wasn't until June 4, 1980, that journalists Brian Barron, the chief Africa correspondent for the BBC, and cameraman Mohammed Amin, no relation, of this news in Nairobi, managed to locate Amin and secure the first interview with him since his deposition. During his time in exile, Amin provided financial support to the remnants of his army that were involved in the Ugandan Bush War. Despite his controversial legacy, a number of Amin's former supporters and various rebel groups persisted in fighting under his banner for many years. Some even called for his amnesty and a potential return to the Ugandan presidency. In interviews conducted during his exile in Saudi Arabia, Amin staunchly believed that Uganda still required his leadership and he never expressed remorse for the brutal actions carried out during his rule. In January 1989, Idi Amin made an unauthorized departure from his exile in Saudi Arabia, accompanied by one of his sons, and journeyed to Zaire with the intention of assembling a rebel force for a potential recapture of Uganda. This move coincided with Uganda's ongoing civil war at the time. While Amin's family remained in Jeddah, he arrived in Zaire using a falsified Zairean passport. However, his distinct presence did not go unnoticed, and he was swiftly apprehended by Zairean security forces upon landing at Najili Airport. The Zairean government, displeased with Amin Saddin Arival, sought to expel him from the country, creating a diplomatic challenge. Saudi Arabia initially declined to welcome him back due to his departure without permission, but after mediation efforts by King Hassan IE of Morocco, the Saudi government eventually allowed Amin's return. In return for his re-entry, Amin had to commit to refraining from political, military activities and interviews. As a result, he spent the rest of his life in Saudi Arabia under these terms, far from the tumultuous events that marked his rule in Uganda. In the twilight years of his life, Idi Amin adopted an unusual dietary regimen reportedly following a fruitarian diet. His daily sustenance primarily consisted of oranges, a dietary preference that led him to be affectionately dubbed Dr. Jaffa by the people of Saudi Arabia. This dietary choice marked a stark contrast from his earlier days of military and political power in Uganda, when his actions and decisions had a profound impact on the nation and its people. While the dictator once held immense authority and instigated a regime characterized by brutality and violence, his later years saw him living a quieter existence, far from the center of global attention. This transition from a figure of controversy and fear to one of relative obscurity highlights the ever-evolving and multifaceted nature of history's most enigmatic personalities, illness and death. On the 19th of July, 2003, a significant chapter in the tumultuous life of Idi Amin neared its end. It was reported that Amin, then married to his fourth wife, Nalongo Medina, had fallen into a coma and was gravely ill at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The cause of his deteriorating health was attributed to kidney failure. In a heartfelt plea to the Ugandan president at the time, Yaweri Museveni, Nalongo Madina requested that Amin be allowed to return to Uganda for the final days of his life. However, Museveni's response was stern, asserting that Amin would have to face the consequences of his actions upon his return, a sentiment echoed by many who remembered the atrocities committed during his rule. Despite these appeals, Amin's family ultimately made the difficult decision to disconnect life support, marking the end of a controversial era. Idi Amin passed away on the 16th of August 2003 at the hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. In death, Amin's departure was notably quiet, devoid of the fanfare and fear that had surrounded his rule. 
he was laid to rest in Ruwais Cemetery in Jeddah, in a simple grave that offered little ceremony. Following Amin's demise, there were shocking revelations that emerged. Such revelations highlighted the extent of international concern during his rule. David Owen, who had served as the British Foreign Secretary from 1977 to 1979, disclosed that he had proposed the assassination of Idi Amin during his time in office. Owen defended this startling revelation, asserting that Amin's regime ranked among the most brutal in African history, an assertion that found resonance with many who remembered the dark days of his rule. Unseen archives of Idi Amin's life. In a remarkable discovery in 2015, thousands of long forgotten photographs have emerged recently, shedding light on life in 1970s Uganda during the tumultuous reign of President Idi Amin. These images, preserved over decades, present a unique and invaluable glimpse into an era characterized by both political turmoil and the daily lives of Ugandans. The photographs, uncovered from dusty archives and private collections by the researchers working in the storeroom at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, form a visual chronicle of President Idi Amin's regime, which lasted from 1971 to 1979. Amin's rule was marked by authoritarianism, human rights abuses, and a radical shift in Uganda's socio-political landscape. The images vividly illustrate the changes brought about by Amin's policies, from the nationalization of industries to the expulsion of ethnic communities. Through these images, the audience gains a deeper understanding of the challenges faced by ordinary Ugandans during this period. Amidst the political upheaval, the photographs also capture the resilience of Ugandans as they navigated daily life. Scenes of markets bustling with activity, children playing in the streets, and families coming together reveal the enduring spirit of the people despite the uncertain times. The photographs introduce us to individuals whose lives were deeply impacted by Amin's rule. From activists and dissidents to everyday citizens, these portraits bring a human dimension to the historical narrative, highlighting the stories of those who resisted, survived, and even thrived in the face of adversity. In a recent PBS television series titled Profiles in Tyranny, Amin stands shoulder to shoulder with figures like Kim Il-sung and Mussolini, embodying an era marked by ruthless autocracy. This narrative, however, contrasts starkly with the reality in Uganda, where the memory of Amin's rule has been purposefully obscured by a government's orchestrated campaign of political amnesia among the public. The absence of memorials, monuments, and spaces for contemplation or discussion on the Amin years underscores this concerted effort of the government to silence the past and its associated atrocities. Presenting a pivotal chance for collective contemplation, these photographs stand as a groundbreaking avenue for public reflection. Approximately 150 carefully chosen images are currently showcased at the Uganda Museum in Kampala, constituting an exhibition titled the Unseen Archive of Idi Amin. This curated display, in which our involvement is notable, offers a unique opportunity for Ugandans and visitors alike to engage with the traumatic and polarizing history of the Amin era, fostering a space for assessment and understanding. The exhibition is scheduled to run until the culmination of 2019, Photographers constantly followed Idi Amin and his officials on every occasion when he was addressing the public. This image captures a rare moment when Idi Amin was seen playing an accordion in 1971. Throughout his presidency, photographers held a steady presence during moments when Idi Amin and his officials addressed the public. An unwaveringly dedicated team of photographers representing Uganda's Ministry of Information meticulously trailed Amin's journey across the country. This ardent crew embarked on a visual odyssey, capturing candid snapshots during press conferences, spirited rallies, celebratory gatherings, and various other events that marked the political landscape of the time. Strikingly, 
only a scanty fraction of the vast array of photographs they captured saw the light of day. Despite their extensive efforts, a mere handful of these images ever made their way to the ink of a printing press or the pages of a publication. The photographic film was carefully developed, and the resulting negatives were painstakingly placed in envelopes, meticulously labelled, and then tenderly tucked away within the confines of a cabinet, as if safeguarding moments frozen in time. This treasure trove of unseen archives, which was in the shadows for so long, held within its delicate folds the visual narratives of an era that continues to evoke intrigue and contemplation. A tangible example from this era comes to life in the form of an arresting photograph captured by the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. The scene depicts a group of traders apprehended in January 1975 for the offense of selling commodities at inflated prices. This single image encapsulates a fragment of the socio-economic turmoil that unfolded during those times, immortalizing an incident that remains a poignant testament to the multifaceted challenges faced by Ugandans during Idi Amin's rule. The lenses of these cameras acted as impartial witnesses to a spectrum of transgressions, ranging from the sins of usury and theft to the underground currents of smuggling. Accused individuals found themselves thrust into the spotlight, facing the camera's unblinking gaze as crowds often converged to witness these public spectacles. Within this orchestrated theater of justice, evidence was meticulously laid bare, leaving no room for ambiguity. Yet, as we go through these visual archives, there is an overarching concern that grips us. While the photographs exude a compelling documentary authenticity, they tend to overlook the harsh realities that permeated daily existence in 1970s Uganda. The unaccountable violence that cast its shadow, the gradual decay of once sturdy infrastructure, and the unrelenting scarcity of even the most basic essentials. All of these facets that punctuated the era are somewhat underrepresented in this collection, evoking a lingering yearning for a more complete historical portrait. During the meticulous curation of the Uganda Museum exhibition, we grappled with a poignant dilemma. The stark absence of images that would illuminate the somber realities of suffering and death as indelible facets of life in the 1970s. Our efforts to capture the era's multifaceted essence were overshadowed by a lingering void as these vital yet distressing dimensions remained inadequately represented within the visual narrative. The curatorial process became a soul-searching journey, compelling us to confront the complexities of historical representation and the narratives that remain untold within the corridors of memory. Legacy Alicia Decker, a gender historian, has astutely observed that Idi Amin's most enduring legacy in Uganda is the deeply ingrained culture of militarism. This culture, deeply rooted in the country's history, continues to shape Uganda's social fabric long after Amin's rule ended. Interestingly, perceptions of Amin within Uganda itself have evolved over the decades since his regime's downfall, often diverging from the international community's view while Amin's brutal rule is universally condemned, some Ugandans have regarded him as a patriot and even supported his decision to expel Asians from the country, reflecting a complex interplay of historical, ethnic and political factors. It is also quite interesting to note that at the time of his death, Amin still garnered a degree of popularity in northwestern Uganda a region where his rule may have been perceived differently from the rest of the country. One of Amin's sons, Jaffa Rimo, has taken it upon himself to challenge the overwhelmingly negative public perception of his father. He has called for a comprehensive investigation into the veracity of the reported abuses that occurred during Amin's rule, suggesting that the historical record may need to be revisited and reassessed in a more nuanced manner. This stance highlights the ongoing debate and complexity surrounding Amin's legacy within Uganda, 
where his impact remains a subject of both contention and reflection. Last word. Idi. Amin's life was characterized by a complex and often brutal journey through the corridors of power. Rising from a humble background, he initially gained recognition as an athlete and military officer. Amin's ascent within the Ugandan army eventually led him to seize control of the country through a military coup in 1971. His rule was marked by extreme authoritarianism, human rights abuses, and erratic behavior. Amin's regime witnessed widespread violence, including mass killings, torture, and political repression. His expulsion of Ugandan Asians and the expropriation of their properties had devastating economic consequences for Uganda. Amin's actions strained international relations, leading to the severing of diplomatic ties with several countries. While Amin's regime was characterized by brutality and chaos, it also had its supporters within Uganda, particularly in certain regions. Some saw him as a patriot and appreciated his expulsion of a science. Despite the controversies surrounding his rule, Amin remained a polarizing figure in Uganda even after his exile. In the international arena, Amin's rule brought Uganda to the forefront of global attention, often for the wrong reasons. His involvement in the hijacking of an Air France plane to Entebbe and subsequent Israeli rescue operation further damaged Uganda's reputation. Amin's life serves as a stark reminder of the devastating consequences of unchecked power and authoritarianism. His legacy continues to be a topic of debate, with differing perspectives on his rule and its impact on Uganda and the broader region. And the what do you think of Idi Amin's military regime? What lessons can we learn from studying the life of Idi Amin about the dangers of unchecked power and the potential for authoritarianism? Do you think international communities should have joined hands and prevented the massive bloodshed that happened during the era of Idi Amin? What role do you think the international community should have played in addressing the human rights abuses committed by Idi Amin during his regime? Share your valuable thoughts about Idi Amin and his brutal regime that left an indelible mark on history in the comments section below. On this note, we are wrapping up today's video. Thank you very much for tuning in.